One of the shows that I worked on that just got released this year, Blue Eye Samurai, just got renewed for a second season. I was working on the show back in 2021, but it was a show where I learned a lot, especially when it came to filmmaking and storyboarding. So in this video, I'd like to talk about that. Hey guys, it's Tineko Pantua, and today I'd like to talk about what my experience was like working on Blue Eye Samurai as a storyboard artist. Now, for those who don't know, Blue Eye Samurai is a miniseries, an adult animated show that follows Mizu, a half Japanese, half white individual who roams around Japan seeking revenge for her overall existence. In the show, Mizu is often discriminated because of her ethnicity being a half breed, as well as having a personal discovery of what it means to be a samurai while challenging her womanhood. It has sex, violence, and other adult themes. So what made Blue Eye Samurai a challenge to work on for me? So as someone who comes from, you know, children's animation, family animation, Blue Eye Samurai is my first serious adult animation. And not only that, they were heavily following live action rules. A lot of the leading directors come from a live action background, such as Jane Wu and a few others. Now, of course, there were other challenges that I had to go through with this production, but for this video, I'm really just going to talk about storyboarding and what made it so different from my other experiences. Blue Eye Samurai was a show that highly focused on live action rules. So we really had to be conscious of how many cameras there were, how many shots we could use, and treating the camera as a tangible object. Like refreshing myself on live action film terminology and how lenses actually worked. In animation, there's a lot more freedom to break some rules. Like sure, there are restrictions, there are certain circumstances and limitations that you need to work with. In this case, I really had to think about the camera. So when I board, let's say a really stylistic graphic shot, I have to really think about how I could replicate that similar effect with the camera, thinking about the lens, where the camera should actually be placed in the set and how to achieve that without just changing the size of things. I really had to think about placing a camera at various locations within the set. Luckily, the set was already built in CG. Now, there were so many times I had to reboard the scene for many different reasons, but I think one reason I could point out that made this production quite different from every other production that I've worked with was that it felt like I was boarding scratch footage. So in live action, there's usually like multiple cameras placed at different places and different angles, shooting the same scene at the same time. And of course there would be multiple takes in footage because one advantage that live action has that animation doesn't really have is that spontaneity. In animation, I'd have to redraw it. And depending on the style of animation, there's way too many steps for a spontaneous acting choice or an improvised change. With live action, you have freedom for alternate takes. And that's all scratch footage that you can use. That footage then goes to editing where different footage is cut together, organized differently, some are taken out, some are kept in for the purpose of storytelling through film. When it came to storyboarding, it was similar to that where we boarded a sequence multiple times in a different atmosphere, in a different angle, in a different tone, and just sent all that to the editor to sort of play around with it. Some were scrapped, some were taken in, or some new stuff was improvised. Now, I'm not saying that live action is wishy-washy, very loose, just spontaneous all the time, because they have a lot of circumstances working against them, such as production cost, crew cost, like cameras are expensive, and trying to figure out camera moves you have to think about the tracks, the boom, and other things for the camera to be able to move. So because some of the higher ups on that production came from live action, they really emphasize about choosing shots that really mattered. So the biggest thing that I learned from working on a show like Blue Eye Samurai is being way more decisive and thoughtful about my shot choices. And that really pushed my cinematic language and compositions. The next thing that I want to talk about is that it has a very specific style of cinematic language. Our references were usually Breaking Bad, Stanley Kubrick, David Fincher, and a lot of the show has a lot of, you know, very still cameras, not a lot of shot changes, and actually really long takes. There were some graphic shots I had to figure out, like a really abstract close-up of a teapot or a really down shot of a group of soldiers forming an image. Like things got very graphic and I had to figure out how I would be able to do that using an actual physical set with a camera and thinking about the camera as a tangible thing with lenses in mind, like I said earlier. And usually that stuff is figured out by the previous. It's not really a storyboard artist's job to figure out that technical stuff, but that was stuff that we had to think about for the show. So let's talk about the storyboards themselves. What do they look like? How did I go about boarding them? And how was it done? 
So for most of my time on Blue Eye Samurai, I was working closely with Rhino Laughlin, who was the director for episode four. That was my first episode. And the way he boards, you know, his boards are amazing. They're fully toned. They're incredibly cinematic and the drawings are very solid. Also, there's tone and shading. It's really well lit too. Rhino Laughlin and our supervising director, Jane Wu, they were boarding in Photoshop. Now in TV animated productions, most productions are boarded using Storyboard Pro, but they were using Photoshop. Now, I'm personally familiar with boarding on Photoshop. It's actually super common in feature animation. So knowing that, I decided to also board in Photoshop. If the file format and the process was working for them, then why not try board the way they do? Most storyboard artists that I've worked with or most productions that I've been at, a lot of the people who boarded using Photoshop use a function called layer comps. And layer comps is basically like setting your own custom presets, indicating which layers are hidden and which layers are visible. And you can set multiple layer comps in one PSD file or one Photoshop document. And then you can export these layer comps as independent images and send that image sequence to editorial. If you guys want me to talk more about this process or the style of storyboarding in Photoshop, let me know. Before I even start storyboarding, I thumbnail my shots. These are rough drawings that indicate the shots, the staging, and some of the ideas that I want to put in my boards. This is a practice that I've always done with every other production, so it hasn't changed. You know, there'll be some cases where I'm working with the director, we're looking at the set together, and we're actually planning where to put the cameras, kind of like, the director working with the director of photography. We're scouting the set and planning camera placements in the set. Now let's move on to storyboarding. The storyboards themselves took a more illustrative approach. So what I mean is that I start with a really thick, big brush, a really thick, girthy brush, and roughly draw them out along with the set. Now, sometimes I'll indicate a mid-tone for the background or the whole set, because again, lighting plays a huge role and it's good to work with a neutral or default mid-tone. I'll separate the backgrounds and the characters from each other. And in most cases, a set is already there. So I usually print screen or screen capture a render of the set and put it into Photoshop. But for this example, we're drawing as if there is no set for it. Now let's say I want to clean up the characters or add a little more detail. I don't really make a new layer and draw over them. Using a small eraser, I start removing elements I don't like and replacing it with smaller brush size strokes just to finesse a bit of those details. And then I add a bit of tone and shading. So I would add a mat under the character just so the character feels more solid and not see-through. And I'll also keep it in sort of a mid-tone. And then I'll add like, let's say white highlights or shadows just to give it more lighting. And in separate layers, I'll blur out lighting effects. I'll add some streaks here and there, blur it, and then brush it away, add some textures, add a gradient to give it more atmosphere. And this is how a lot of the boards that I did for Blue Eyes Samurai retain a lot of that atmosphere. And I'll keep adjusting it, keep finessing it until I have a storyboard panel that's ready for the production of Blue Eyes Samurai. A board like this isn't too polished and it's not too rough. It's just right. It's something that I can keep going with. Now, here's an example where I'm using layer comps to have multiple panels in one Photoshop document. I don't board an entire sequence in one Photoshop document. It would make that document too chaotic and too big. In my opinion, Photoshop isn't really an ideal storyboarding program, but when you can be creative with it, when you can make it work, it works. So here's me using layer comps to have multiple panels in one document where I have characters doing different various poses. And I'll also move the background element or the background image to you know show a bit of camera movement. Now, when it comes to more dynamic scenes like this, I tend to draw much looser and more gestural because you know the detail of the drawing doesn't really matter anymore, especially in a storyboard like this where things happen really fast and loose. It's not worth over polishing. I mean, I could, but for now I tend to keep it really rough. And sure, it may look really rough without tone, without shading, but let's see what happens when I do add shading because sometimes just adding a bit of tone, adding a bit of highlights or adding a bit of shadow just finalizes the storyboard and just makes it look finished. I mean, when it comes to storyboarding, the importance is not really how beautiful the drawing looks. I mean, it's great to have that, but it's also more important to have clarity and storytelling chops because at the end of the day, this show is going to be animated in CG. But one thing that's clear when it comes to boarding in a show like Blue Eye Samurai is that lighting played such a huge role that we wanted to indicate lighting in our storyboards, regardless of how rough the drawings were. So do you guys remember that I made an action set for Photoshop that allowed you to automate your drawings, your sketches, and then you can add preset lighting effects, some highlights, some shadows, etc. It's because of the show. 
Because I was working with a director and an editor that preferred PSD files and Photoshop, and I'm familiar with boarding in Photoshop because it's common feature animation, I made an action set that auto-toned and did lighting effects on your sketches. And this doesn't only apply to storyboarding, it also applies to just sketches in general or drawings that you just want to have a mat underneath the sketch so you can mask it, color it however you want it, or you can make key art or story beats where you can actually play with the tone. If that's something that interests you, go to my Gumroad page and look for it, or look for the link in the description below. If you want to think like storyboarding in the style of Blue Eye Samurai, or thinking about storyboarding for a show like Blue Eye Samurai, is to think about it as if you're boarding in a live action set. Limited count of different shots, shots that have a sense of cinematic language, meaning that each shot you can kind of convey there's a bit of storytelling without any dialogue involved, and an emphasis of blocking out the composition of your shots, with the use of values like light versus dark. You know, boarding on a show like Blue Eyes Samurai was truly a once in a lifetime experience. I've never worked in a production like this. It was quite a challenge. I struggled a lot with it just because it was very new to me, but I learned a lot and it's basically changed the way how I board nowadays. Well, approach to storyboarding now. So, you know, I wanna give my special thanks to, you know, Jane Wu, our supervising director, Ryan O'Laughlin, and Alan Taylor, who are my directors for episode four and seven, respectfully. And my board partners who I became close friends with, such as Elsa, Whaley, Micah, we all joined the show all together, and I feel like I formed a closer relationship with my storyboard partners. Blue Eye Samurai recently got announced for season two, and honestly, I'm glad the production has been getting the support that it has been getting. I'm glad that you guys like it. Um, you know, I'll talk about more stuff later on. Anyways, bye. Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. Learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos. Visit the store through the link in the description below.